I'm here today with a stalwart warrior in the pro-life movement, Father Frank Pavone, a good friend. Uh, he, as you know, ran into some trouble with Pope Francis last year, and uh, he was canceled. And as the year has progressed, we've seen more and more of a cancel culture in the Catholic Church under the pontificate of Pope Francis without appeals. And a lot of people are confused on that. So today we invite Father Frank Pavone on. We're going to talk about Bishop Strickland, pro-life work, and just what's going on in Father Frank Pavone's life. So Father Pavone, welcome back. Great to see you. It's great to be back, Taylor. Uh, thank you for having me as always. And uh, thanks for all the great work that you continue to do. Awesome. So just real quick, your initial thoughts on the canceling of Bishop Strickland. Wasn't surprising. Uh, it not, wasn't surprising at all. You know, he, no matter what they say, the Vatican is not concerned about his governance of the Diocese of Tyler, Texas. They're concerned about his national influence. And you and I have seen it. Countless faithful have seen it. Uh, people know it. Uh, he's, been, he's not called America's bishop for no reason. Uh, and it's that that they're concerned about. Uh, just like in my case, you know, at first they tried to get me out from the leadership of Priests for Life, but it wasn't that that they were concerned about. It was our influence over the over the uh, this, what you might call the the soul of the American Catholic. You know, where's the heartbeat of the American Catholic faithful warrior every day that's making sacrifices to live out their faith? And there's something here that, of course, they neither seem to understand nor care about which is that, you know, and it goes back to some of the key issues that both Bishop Strickland and you and I and so many others are, are speaking out about when you see, for example, Biden, you know, and Pelosi, you know, uh, 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 going to communion and, 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 and saying, oh, yeah, this is this is no problem. What they're missing, what, the, what, the, what the, some of these shepherds are missing, what about the faithful Catholic who's sacrificing significantly every day to live out their faith? They're giving things up in order to stay in union with Christ, in order to be worthy to receive communion. And of course, we always put worthy in quotation marks. It's not an absolute worthiness, but we, 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 we live up to the standards that the church sets out, right? So it's like they're making sacrifices to live their faith, and they're looking at these people who are throwing those sacrifices out the window, and then they, 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 they want to get all the benefits of, of receiving communion anyway. So it's an insult to the faithful. And it's not a not a not a, a, a desire to, to punish anybody. It's it's an insult. It hurts. So people are looking at people like Bishop Strickland and saying, "Wow, you know what? I'm I'm encouraged. I'm strengthened. I'm healed. I'm consoled. Let me listen more to to what he's saying." The sad thing, isn't it, is that what he has been doing and saying, and the way he's been shepherding his diocese, shouldn't be getting national attention, because it should be the norm. People should look at it and say, eh, of course, he's a bishop. What else do you expect? But the very fact that he has such national influence and it gets so much attention is itself a condemning commentary on the lack of leadership. Yeah. You know, what you just said there, Father Pavone, about the hurt, that is one of the things that I don't think the Vatican fully understands that the lay person, we're talking about moms pregnant with their fifth child. We're talking about dads who are like, how am I going to support this family? We're talking about, you know, grandmothers and grandfathers who their children or grandchildren maybe are not practicing the faith or even right. worse have been, you know, molested. I mean, just horrible things going on. And then on top of that, you have our culture and our politics going towards abortion, going towards agendas of the alphabet soup. We're watching all this happen, and the, the Catholic layperson, the sheep, looks to the shepherds, their bishop, and their pope. Help us. Help right. us. Bah, help us. And then yeah. we see leaders like you in the pro-life movement, Bishop Strickland as well, and we're like, okay, finally, there's voices out there you know, in yeah. all your work for decades. I mean, I even knew when I was a Protestant 20 years ago, I knew who you were and what you were doing. We see right. these voices and then we're like, okay, we have some guys with it. And then down from the Vatican, crack, crack. And these guys are yeah. getting canceled. The, the visceral hurt. And this is where I think these people are so tone deaf up in Rome. 
they don't understand the hurt of the lay people. Is that a, yeah. is that your experience, especially as you've talked to people in the last oh. year as as the caller? You've been you've been canceled. You've been defrocked. Yes, that corresponds with the conversations over the last year, but also over the last 21 years since uh, under Cardinal Egan, this attack on me began trying to pull me away from Priest for Life. And 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 what what is it's just an absolute not caring. You know, we we right. kept making the case from the time that Cardinal Egan said to me without any uh, any apparent concern for the ministry of Priests for Life. So, oh, you have to come back and do do parish work. I said, don't you realize this is going to be a scandal? Don't you realize this is going to create confusion among people who are going to think rightly or wrongly that the church is backing away from pro-life? It's like they don't they didn't even didn't even care, didn't even give the slightest weight to that. And in this latest thing, you know, when, when and, and you know, this wasn't out of the blue. We saw it coming that they were going to uh, dismiss me from the priesthood. And and I said to them, you don't realize this, the, uh, the, the hurt that's going to cause to people in the pro-life community. And you know what their answer to us was? Oh, we, well, we have ways of, of, of dealing with that. You have ways of dealing with that. What's wrong with you? But you're saying you 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 know there's going to be hurt and oh you're going to deal with it instead of prevent it. What ways are you going to have to deal with that? And and so it's like these people are way way off the track, way way disconnected from the grassroots uh, pro life believing Catholic. Yeah, that's like uh, two parents getting divorced and people say, well, it's going to really hurt the children. Like, well, we have we can deal with that. It's like you don't yeah. really fully appreciate the the nuclear. <laughs> the nuclear pain that is being inflicted. And, you know, people say, well, if you talk about this, people are going to leave the church. I'm always the first one saying, do not leave the church. Do not jump off of Noah's Ark. Stay within the body of Christ, no matter what. And then right. like, well, if you talk about this, people are going to leave. Well, the problem is not talking about it. The problem is the problem. And the problem right, right now, and Bishop Strickland I ran the video five years ago where he gets in front of the entire USCCB at the USCCB convention in 2018, right after everything on McCarrick came out. And he says, we need to hold each other accountable. We need to go back to the gospel. We need to go back to the catechism. We need to go back to the, to the Catholic teachings. And yeah. in, that, in that speech, he says the H word. He talks about homosexuality. He talks about seminarians that are at risk. And as I watched that video, I was like, man, they put the target on him five years ago for getting up to say that info. Do oh, you yeah. agree? Do you oh, think yeah. they've, they've obviously been watching you for decades. When Absolutely. do you think they put the, the sniper rifle on Strickland? I would say at that, at that point there, that's when I started thinking, wow, the way that he's talking Calling to account, not in a not, not in a harsh or arrogant way. This is a man, you know. You talk to him a lot directly, as have I. What comes across his great humility, his great prayerfulness, just his love of Jesus that is so clear. And so it was not in an arrogant way, but when I saw him really taking to task in an effective way, his brother bishops, that was the thought that ran through my mind. They're not going to tolerate this for long because they never do. They never do. And, and I think, uh, Taylor, you and I have to start talking about cultish behavior. Mm. Uh, this has been running through my mind, uh, you know, in a cult. And the Catholic Church is not a cult. Some fundamentalist enemies of the Catholic Church will call us that for theological reasons, but, but we can put that aside. But I'm talking about cultish behavior in the sense of the way you deal with, with criticism of authority, and the way you deal with members who have been thrown out of the cult. In a cult, no uh, uh, criticism, questioning, or any kind of negative inferences to the authority are permitted. Now, A, that's not healthy. B, that's not Catholic teaching. I always go back, you, I think you and I have discussed it before, I always go back to the book that Russell Shaw wrote some years ago. He used to be the communications director for the, for, the, for the USCCB. And the title of his book is Nothing to Hide. And the subtitle is Communion, Secrecy, and Communication in the Catholic Church. Excellent book. I would recommend it to all of our viewers and all of our listeners. And Russell Shaw talks about this. He says, you know what, why do the bishops make decisions 
and then not explain to the people the rationale behind the decision. And that is so characteristic of what they did for Bishop Strickland. Oh, no reason was given. Maybe that's because they would be uh, embarrassed if the reason were given, you know, or in the same case with me, people are like, what, disobedience to your bishop? About what? Blasphemous social communications? About what? I don't know. I don't know. So it's like, it would be nice if they would explain themselves, but there's that lack of respect for the people under their authority. It's not that we deny their authority. It's a lack of respect for the people under their authority when they make the decisions and give them no rational basis. Even if you look at Cardinal DiNardo's statement, right, the statement he put out about the, about the removal of Bishop Strickland, it's heavy on process, it's heavy on authority, it's completely lacking on rationale. It's like, what is this? Are we a cult or are we human beings who can think, who can reason, who can dialogue, who can respect each other and who can hash out our differences? Yeah. Let's one of the things that canon lawyers have already been discussing. Uh, I want to touch on your case as well, but it, it also touches Bishop Strickland. And that is to deprive a bishop from his diocese. There has to be a crime. And so far, we've yeah. seen no crime. The worst I've seen out there is he was a bad administrator of his diocese. <laughs> his diocese is not bank. There's dioceses right now being bankrupted, right? He has a lot of seminarians. I mean, I've been over to Tyler. Everybody seen, that I meet down there loves Bishop Strickland out in Tyler. I was there yesterday out in Tyler. Mm -hmm. um, no crime given. And then on yours as well, you were told something locally by the bishop. You even went to Rome all the way up the ladder to confirm it. Turns out it was not the case. So it's not right. just we're not going to say anything. There seems to be some levels of deception. So if you could talk about that with regard to Bishop Strickland and then your own case. Yeah, you know, he what struck me about what, what he said. Now, of course, no reason was given publicly. But then he said, oh, they gave me a whole list of concerns that they had. But you remember him saying, I stand by every one of those. In other words, I wouldn't have done anything different. That says to me, there could not possibly have been a crime there. I mean, well, how could you say, I stand say? by my crime against the church? Right, right, right. I mean, some people do commit crimes. They should be punished. But it's like. OK. And he gave one example of what one of those concerns was, and that was his his um, uh, articulation of concerns about the synod. Oh, yeah. Together with some a few million other people. You know, right. I, I mean, of course, I'm concerned about. So. So, again, cultish behavior. We can't raise questions anymore in the in the community, in the family of the church. We can't raise concerns anymore. As you know, canon law itself provides um, for our, our right to raise concerns of things that we think are going to be harmful or confusing to the to the body of Christ. So that we see going on, and in, in it's the same, you know what, it's the same MO when you look at how they, de 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 dealing with Bishop Strickland, how they dealt with me, and how, and if you switch it over to the civil arena, no matter what our, our viewers' views might be about President Donald Trump, just from the point of view of cancel culture and weaponization of government, the way he and his associates are treated, look at, for example, the impeachment process. They, 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 what was the crime for which they, they were impeaching? There was none. And they used this, this vague, oh, abuse of power. What in the world does that mean? That can mean anything. You're not specifying a crime. In all these, uh, what is it, 91 charges now that they've brought against them in four different indictments, there's not a single crime. There's absolutely nothing there. So the me the method of, of, of going through this is exactly the same in all these cases. You kick up dust, you get somebody in a position of authority, uh, a prosecutor, a judge, a DA, somebody, Congress, whoever you want to get, somebody who has respectable position of authority, you get them to kick up some dust. It's all very vague and confusing, but, but again, just like Cardinal DiNardo's statement, heavy on process. Oh, you see, we went through all this process. Yeah, but that doesn't mean anything if there's no substance that the process is dealing with. Heavy on process and heavy on authority, boiling down to, why did you do this? Why? Because I said so. It's like, no, 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 that's not, uh, sorry, but that's not good enough. 
Again, it's not a denial. We're not rebelling against authority. We're staying in union with the church. You know, it's funny, Taylor. Some people have asked me. I've developed a lot of friendships, of course, with folks in, in all denominations. They say, hey, come on over to us. You know, we love you. It's like, no, 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 you don't get it. You know, the Catholic Church was founded by Jesus. I'm going to always remain a faithful Catholic. And in fact, I'm going to always remain a priest ontologically, and I'm going to keep knocking at the door to get my ministry restored. I'm not leaving anywhere, going anywhere. But, um, uh, but, but, but it's the I, I because I said so. I told you. I because I. That's not the way authority is supposed to be exercised in the church. Yeah, I mean, I'm a father. I have eight kids, and you know, there are times like, well, why do we have to go to this thing? It's just like, well, get in the van, we're going, you know, and I'll tell you later. But when, yeah, when it, you can. If you do that enough and you're heavy handed with it, you can begin to break your children, right. uh, especially as your children become teenagers and adults, right? That You do have the authority, but you're also bringing them into adulthood to think properly, to think lawfully, to think rationally. And so you have to explain, you know, like, well, let's just say a teenager says, well, we don't have to go to mass every Sunday. And you're like, well... The church says so, and I say so, and you're going. Okay, yeah. that, that is real, okay? But a a good father would explain the merits of the Mass, the gift yes. of the Eucharist, transubstantiation, the the being life. rightly disposed, yeah. uh, going to confession. Like A good father is going to form the conscience to the child so that hopefully, even if the child is going to reject it, they are rejecting something that has been properly stated and articulated. And I would encourage all Catholic parents and priests watching that, yes, you can appeal to authority, but if you appeal, appeal to authority over and over and over and you're heavy handed and you never give the rationale to it, you can break your kids and you can drive them away. And that is what's going on right now is they are, people are being yes. driven away and they're saying, well, we're the Cardinal and we're the Pope and all that. And they're not giving well, the rationale. And then when we look over the aisle and we see bishops in Germany blessing same sex unions and we're like, well, why is that? We don't get an answer on that either. And so this is, well, the, Taylor, hurt. This is the hurt. I, I think for our people that are listening now, I want to say to them, this is not only about this abuse of authority against Bishop Strickland, me, or any of the other canceled priests or bishops. I want to say to them, this is about you and your relationship with the church. Because Taylor, I'm sure you hear it as much as I do. People who will come to us and say, hey, I had this great idea for a, a special prayer service that we could have in our parish, a rosary march, a, a pro-life event, uh, handing out some voter education materials. And I brought it to our pastor and he shut us down and he said no. And I always say to people like that, OK, we respect the authority of the pastor to decide what will or will not be done by the parish. And then I always say, but I already know the answer. I always say to them, did he give you a reason? And what's the answer? The answer is always no. Always. I've never, there's never been an exception to it. Oh, no, 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 no reason. Did you ask him for a reason? And I think that that part of the hurt of what's going on here is that people realize, and maybe they're not articulating or connecting all the dots, but many people are. And they're saying, wait a minute, I'm being treated the same way on the local level in my parish. I'm being treated the same way. And what this does is it discourages people from taking initiative. Um, and it, it's so at odds, isn't it, with the with the stated purpose of the synod? Oh, we got to listen to one another more. But they're doing exactly the opposite. It's like if the pastor would only, you know, just sit down. Don't just send. And, and, they'll, and they'll send the no, you know, with just some a, a one word, a one sentence letter, you know, or a one word email. It's like this is not the way we treat one another. Sit down, discuss the matter. And, um, you know, Russell Shaw in that book I mentioned, Nothing to Hide, he quotes the Second Vatican Council, some beautiful stuff from John Paul II about how those in authority in the church and again, this, this applies to the parish as much as it applies to the Vatican, have to recognize that among the laity, there's a lot of expertise. There's a lot of insight. There's a lot of gifts poured out by the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of knowledge and skill and experience. A wise pastor is going to make use of that and, and is going to listen to that and is going to respect the input that is given. And again, when you look at the synod, I mean, it's such a bundle of contradictions 
you know, on one level, when those things are being said, that, hey, laity really have a lot to offer in the, in the leadership of the church, it's like there's a real truth to that, except that then they, they go, they turn around and throw it in the, in the garbage. It's like, no, really listen to people, and then maybe you can make your decision in a way that's, uh, maybe let the church benefit from uh, what, these, what these people have to offer, or what these movements have to offer, like the pro-life movement. Yes. Now, they took a different approach to Bishop Strickland than they did to you. Bishop Strickland, of course, he's a bishop. He was removed from his diocese. They did not suspend him. They did not restrict him, and uh, they definitely didn't laicize him or remove him from priestly ministry. You, they kind of went for the jugular, Father. They really hit you hard, you know? Well, they, I'll tell you, yeah. And I they was, threw everything you, at you. And, and, and why yeah. is that going to yeah. happen to Strickland uh, eventually if he keeps— you know, speaking and what? traveling, or why? Why did you get uh, nuked? Yeah, here's 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 one of the reasons for the difference, uh, and that's a good observation. Remember what they did with Bishop Strickland. First, they did a visitation. Mm -hmm. Now they did a visitation for me too. They did a visitation of priests for life. This was like ten years ago, twelve, eleven years ago. It was actually a very positive experience. I mean, a visitation can be something very positive. We had a conservative bishop doing it, um, and that makes all the difference. You know, who's the visitator? And, um, uh, you know, a visitation can be of a blessing for a, for a ministry, for a parish, for a diocese, for a religious order, um, where they come aside you, and if they come aside you in the right spirit and say, how can we help your ministry serve the church better— uh, and you do the whole thing in a spirit of of solidarity and, and humility, yeah, you can benefit from it. And what ended up at the result of our visitation, none, they had some recommendations. They always will have recommendations, but they made the point that none of it was obligatory. So they didn't find anything that we, we were doing wrong that they had to say, no, you can't do this, or yes, you have to do that. It was all all optional uh, suggestions and recommendations. Okay, so maybe the Vatican wasn't so happy that, you know, uh, they found things to be in such good order. Um, but then they tried in multiple ways to get me to step aside from the leadership of Priests for Life. Because if they can get somebody out of a position of influence without causing too much trouble, they're always going to try that first. And in fact, isn't that what they did with Bishop Strickland? They said, well, we're going to ask you to resign. Now, he had already said publicly, he said to, to us privately, so if they ask me, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to step aside. They're going to have to force me out. Um, but they tried to get me out of Priest for Life. Now, the difference between my case and Bishop Strickland, the Pope has jurisdiction over who the bishop of a diocese is. It's ultimately the pope that appoints the bishop to the diocese or removes him. And, you know, Bishop Strickland made it clear. It's not that the pope doesn't have authority to do this. He, he does. In my case, they didn't have authority to remove me. They had no jurisdiction because we're, at, we're an organization that has a board of directors and it's not part of the juridical structure of the church. So it's like all they could do was try to persuade. Now, at one point, as we discussed in one of our one of our program, one of the times you had me on while all that was was coming out, a Cardinal Dolan tried to take over our board. At one point, he sent me a list of people. He said, These people should be on your board. This should be your chairman. And I, I had to turn around and say to him, with all due respect, you've got no authority here. You've, you've got no jurors. You don't. It's the board of priests for life that elects the board of priests for life, not the Cardinal Archbishop of New York. So and the Vatican affirmed that very clearly, too. They said, yeah, obviously, these people are they have a certain level of autonomy. Right. The bottom line with me, the reason, like you said, that they came down so hard and had to remove me from the priesthood altogether is that what they first tried to do was to take Father Frank out of priests for life. They couldn't do that because I wouldn't I wouldn't leave uh, and there was no reason to. And so so they had to take the father out of Frank and 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 and, and, uh -huh. and that's what, that's what they, they, they left them no option. What they were trying to undo again, going back to the beginning of our conversation was the influence. If a Roman Catholic priest in good standing shows up at a, a conference of CPAC and says mass there. And is encouraging these MAGA Republicans to, to you know get go forward on the road to victory, 
They don't like that because that doesn't correspond to their politics. How are we going to how are we going to stop this this priest from from making it seem to these people that this is OK with the church? Well, we can tell him, uh, you know, he can't have that position anymore. But then none of that worked. I kept going to those events. I kept bringing that message. And so ultimately they had to, to take by taking the collar away. They're distancing the church from the message that I'm there giving now to their dismay. I'm still out there giving that same message and everybody knows who I am. And and so it's like, yeah, it is, they continue to be frustrated, but there's nothing else they can do. In the case of Bishop Strickland, he's going to keep giving the message too. And he's still a bishop. So could they go to that f further step? Yeah, these people are tyrants. I mean, there's no, when, when weaponization happens, I mean, this is the weaponization of government in the church. And just like we see the weaponization of government in the civil arena, I hope our viewers have seen the movie Police State. I don't know if you've talked about it yet uh, on your programs, but that is this is a film people need to see. Police State um, shows all about the weaponization of government. Our friend Mark Alk and all these people and President Trump himself. And it's like they, they, they just because weaponization is dressed up in religious garb, you know, and, 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 and conducted with religious language doesn't make it any less weaponization and doesn't make it any less wrong. So there's no rationale. So, yeah, I think they could do anything. I wouldn't put anything past them at this point. I like your observation here that ultimately the cancellations are about prominence and influence. So, you know, yes. let's, let's take another one out there. Father James Altman. Right. He was, I mean, he was not well known. He was not even close as well known as you are. He didn't have a uh, outward independent apostolate. He didn't have videos. You know, they, he made a, some, a sermon and then he made one video initially saying you can't vote pro-abortion. You can't vote pro-Democrat and call yourself a Catholic. And it was a short right. video that he made. Man, as soon as he did that, and that video went viral. I don't know how many millions of views it got, but it went viral. I remember. It was huge. Everyone was talking about it yeah. after church at coffee, at every single Catholic church in America. Again, at that point, when you have that yes. amount of influence, that's when the clock starts ticking down. That's when they exactly. put a target to your back. And yes. Same thing yes. for him. So you were and are highly influential in the Catholic American church. And so much so that outside of Catholicism, pro-life leaders all know Father Frank Pavone. Protestants know Father Frank Pavone. Like if you, I explain to people like, you know, five years ago, you say, Who are, who's the Catholic leaders or the, even the pro-life leaders uh, in the pro-life movement? They're all, everyone, no matter your Catholic, is going to say Father Frank Pavone. So you have this influence. And you know who else we saw this with? And they went after and just tried to get her? Mother Angelica. Yes. They were That's right. after her like a duck on a June bug. <laughs> yeah. And remember what she said about, uh, I, I had such, such it was beautiful years uh, from 94 to the time, to the, the time that then she had her, her um, uh, disability and she wasn't able to talk anymore. I was privileged to say mass in her room. Can you imagine I was there with it, with a relic of jo the blood of John Paul II, the Holy Eucharist that mother Angelica I said, Oh my goodness, what's going on here. Um, but in the conversations, you know, and she said it publicly she said, yeah, she said, you know, the bishops, they, they want to take over this network because, you know, they failed at making their own, you know, and they're envious of us, he says. But I'll blow the whole thing up before they get their hands on it. <laughs> remember she said that? Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> but that proves your point. Yeah. You, you can be the most conservative, orthodox, whoever, right? But as soon as you get that influence and that prominence— all guns are out, all knives are out, they're gonna come after you. And we see that with these cancellations. And, uh, and I think I think that's on purpose. It's on purpose because yeah. all the US bishops who maybe are starting to say, you know, I'm gonna go say something, they see a bishop fired from his diocese, they start to second guess, well, you know, maybe I should be quiet. I'll just I'll just work behind the scenes. I will never say anything public. I'm going to go along to get along. And that's exactly what the infiltrators and the one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church want to achieve. 
why should we live in uh, walking on eggshells? You know, this is the sad thing about it. See, I think from the point of view, again, of most of our viewing audience right now, the faithful Catholic who, who's living the faith every day, making a living, doing their best, uh, it's like they don't make these distinctions between, you know, if they get inspiration in, to live their faith from you, from me, from Mother Angelica, or from Bishop Strickland, or from their parish priest or their bishop, they're not they're not so concerned about the distinctions between the sources. They're concerned about living the faith and getting the inspiration. And so it seems to me, from my experience, these faithful Catholics are going to look at wherever the inspiration comes from, and they're going to say thank you. And they're going to say thank you in such a way that they're also saying, hey, you know, I know I know the faith already. It's not that you're telling me something about the faith I, I don't know. It's that you're reaffirming. It's about strengthening one another. Like Jesus said to Peter, strengthen your brethren. And, and in the letter of the Hebrews, we read about we must come together and encourage one another while it is still today. So it's not a matter of, and I think, Taylor, this is a big piece of the puzzle, too. And it goes back to our discussion about these, these authorities not giving a rationale for their decisions. It's like, wait a minute, the Pope doesn't have any books of the Bible, more books of the Bible than you and I have. He doesn't have any more chapters of the Catechism right. than you and I have. He doesn't have any more dogmas than we already believe. The faith is not, we're not Gnostics. It, we're, we're not, it, it's not like there's, there's things that we don't know about the faith and oh in this meeting of the cardinals with the bishop uh, they have the secret knowledge and if they deign to give it to us oh won't that be great no and and this is what this is this is what makes forces them to be accountable because if they don't teach the faith guess who 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 knows that they're not teaching the faith we the faithful the census fidelium right so we all know the faith and, and the faithful Catholics who's hearing it from Mother Angelica, you, me, whoever, Bishop Strickland, they're grateful for that. And what would what saddens them and, and hurts them is that when they see this rivalry among these teachers of the faith or, or people who should be teachers of the faith, it's like, wait a minute, why are you guys against each, each other? Aren't we all believing living and encouraging each other in the same faith and and this is what causes the confusion on the on the on the grassroots level and it's because some of these people in authority are giving into first of all some of them don't just don't believe it and secondly some of them they're just giving into human petty envy and jealousy and arrogance and pride and and my you know what my can, canon lawyer told me my main canon lawyer i have a whole team of them but during all my battles it was the saddest thing i, I ever heard from from uh, from these advisors, he said to me about these bishops, what they can't control, they kill. Mm. What they can't control, they kill. There's the cancel culture in the church. Wow. And that's exactly what we're seeing. What would be your advice? There's priests that watch this channel, that watch this podcast, they're listening. Uh, I've been contacted with a few, by a few priests already in the last week who have expressed to me how unsettled they are. Not that they're yeah. losing their faith, not that they go anywhere, but they're like, wow, if they're going to cancel Bishop Strickland, we are all on the chopping block. What, what's your message to them as a canceled priest? You know, life is short. <laughs> and ultimately, we've got to look at ourselves in the mirror and also in the mirror of prayer. And when we go to the judgment, God isn't going to ask us to account for the level of knowledge and courage that he did or didn't give to someone else. I'm not going to have to account for what my bishop or my pastor did or didn't know or what courage he did or didn't exercise or what gifts of the Holy Spirit he had or didn't have. I'm going to have to answer to God for what he gave me. And so ultimately... We've got to be ourselves. We've got to be true to ourselves. And we're talking about ourselves in Christ. We're not saying this in an individualistic, more, you know, morally relativistic way. That, that, that individual, that kind of individualism, we don't believe it. What we're saying is we've got to be true to our, our true selves in Christ and say, 
Am I at peace or not? And this this kind of goes to I, I would I would invite these priests to think about you know what I was just saying that we can't walk on eggshells. I I think I shared with you during the during the last presidential campaign when I was um, on the advisory one of the advisory teams for, with President Trump. I think you were on with me, uh, the Catholics Catholic Voices for Trump, and it was like. We had a, a, a weekly prayer. We had a rosary each week uh, by by conference call, and they asked me if I could get other priests to come on and lead the rosary, and we did succeed in doing that every single week. But a lot of the good priests that I asked to do that, they said, "Hey, I'm with you 100%." He says, "But I, 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 I'm afraid to do it because uh, you know I'm under the gun. I'm, I'm they're scrutinizing my every move. I'm going to get in trouble with my bishop." And again, I say to myself, wait a minute, this isn't healthy. This is not, what's going on here? Why Why should a priest, why should a bishop, why should a layperson feel like in their desire to live the faith and to proclaim the faith, they're walking on eggshells? Or, you know, the, the, the bishops, or our pastors, our bishops are not supposed to be our enemies. Our pope is not supposed to be our enemy. This is the sadness. This is the hurt. And I would say to these priests, look, we got to be true to ourselves. We've got to be true to Christ. We've got to support one another. Don't suffer this in isolation. Open your mouth, even if it's just to one other person. Get a brother priest or get a friend who's a lay person. And please don't isolate yourself under this pain and don't end up being repressed in the sense that, hey, I really need to, this is wrong. You know, because Taylor, if we don't speak out about it the way you and I do all the time, and again, I thank you for the the, the way that you 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 do your work and you get the message out to so many people. If you and I didn't do this, it wouldn't be healthy for us. Because then, what? Where does all that concern go? You know, when people are made aware of these things and they're concerned about them, the only healthy thing to do is we've got to give it an outlet, and that would be my 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 advice to to these priests. Yeah. And of course, as a priest, you have the mass, so you can enter into the mass. Your priest yes. and victim, it's beautiful. I know a lot of people ask me all the time, um, "Hey, what's the situation with Father Pavone? How's his appeal going?" They don't really fully appreciate that you didn't just get sort of the the Bush League cancellation. You got the full on cancellation, right, 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 where Francis himself is. You are removed, even though you're a priest forever ontologically, you are removed from the priestly state, and there is no appeal. For people who yeah. missed our interview before on that, can you explain the nature of your cancellation so that people fully understand? Right, right. right. We've been appealing, and often successfully, for 21 years. Uh, from the time Cardinal Egan, I, I had been head of Priest for Life for seven years, and, and in, in 2001, when, when he took over in New York in 2000, Cardinal O'Connor died in 2000, he took over shortly thereafter. And, and from that time to now, there have been many, many efforts to restrict my ministry, take me out of the leadership of Priest for Life, et cetera, et cetera. And I kept appealing to the Vatican. And most of the times that we appealed to the Vatican started under John Paul. It went through the papacy of Benedict and even under Pope Francis, even under Pope Francis. The Vatican ruled in our favor multiple times. It was only when there was a change in personnel at the Congregation for Clergy that, that things then went the wrong way. But all of this to say, this has been a process of appealing for 21 years. Now, what, as you said, what has just happened a year ago, oh, by the way, remind me, I have an in interesting observation about dates. I don't know if you noticed this. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, what they did last year was they said, okay, this is the end of the road. We are throwing you out of the priesthood. No more appeal. We're, we're done with the process of appeals. We're done with the canonical proceedings. We're done. You're out. That's what they said. So in their mind, it's, it's like a Supreme Court decision in the, in the civil arena. Supreme Court, there's nothing above the Supreme Court, right? But the Supreme Court can change its mind, as it just did on Roe v. Wade. So what, uh, what the political reality here is that we need a change in personnel, Personnel is policy. We need a change in in the in, and we will get a change eventually in the papacy. We we don't wish any harm to Pope Francis. Uh, you know, God God bless him. We pray he's our brother in Christ, no matter what wrong he's doing. But um, uh, we don't wish harm or ill on anyone. But the day will come where we will have a new pope, and there will be new people in the congregation for clergy and in all these other offices. 
what it is that I need to do right now, canonically, it's just, it's not even a process, it's a request, it's a favor. You're basically asking a favor of the Pope, Holy Father, please re-examine my, my situation and please see that this is, this is not right, this is not the right, right decision. Could you please reverse? Of course the Pope can reverse, he has the authority to reverse it. But politically, realistically, we're probably talking about the next pope uh, to, that'll have to do that. And we've got a lot of friends among the cardinals and, uh, you know, we'll make our case. But the point here, too, is that for those that are, and I'm so grateful for the concern and for even the people asking how I'm doing, uh, many people know exactly how I'm doing, you know, because I'm out there doing the work. Uh, I would invite people to keep connected with our ministry, see what we're doing. I even, not only do I broadcast every day like you do, but I have a daily diary. I go online and I tell people in full transparency what I did every day from the moment I got up to the moment I go to bed. And I've been doing that for years. And so it's up there, priestforlife.org slash daily dash diary. And so it's like the reason I do that is I want to show people exactly what I'm doing. I want to show people exactly how I'm doing. And I'm doing great. I mean, the Lord has given me a great amount of encouragement, a great amount of peace. Um, I haven't changed what I'm desiring to do for the last 30 years. And um, and the people are continuing to support the work. This is the most encouraging thing. Um, and that's the best thing people can do for me. If they believe in the work that we're doing at Priest for Life, the work that I'm doing, they believe in the message, then let's stick together. We got to keep supporting one another. And uh, that's the rebuke, uh, Taylor, it seems to me, to authorities that have gone astray. The rebuke is, see, what I said before, but what my candidates said, what they can't control, they kill. The rebuke to them is not leaving the church, rebelling, or even lashing out in anger. The rebuke is, hey, you didn't kill it. It's still alive. In fact, it's growing. It's flourished. The people of God may, see, when, when they said to me, as this process was going, going on, oh, there's no appeal. If they kick you out of the priesthood, there's no appeal. I said, listen, there's three appeals. One is to my conscience. I'm at peace. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm going to continue to do. And number two, to God Almighty, okay? And number three, I'm going to appeal this to the people of God. And they really didn't like that. You should have seen how nervous they got when I started talking like that. Because they want to this way on all this to be swept under the rug. Uh, but I've been very outspoken about it. As Bishop Strickland is, I hope he do, does so even more. Give us, tell us all those concerns that they that they told you. Um, but it's we appeal to the people of God. And it's like, okay, everybody, you guys make the judgment. Am I doing wrong or am I doing right? Is Bishop Strickland being a faithful bishop or is he being a bad bishop? You guys decide. And that happens de facto. The people of God decide. And they're going to decide with their support. They're going to decide by coming to events. You know, this is a funny thing that happened in October. Bishop Strickland and I both spoke at a Divine Mercy conference in California. You know, that conference was originally going to be sponsored by the diocese. And when they heard that we were coming, they said, what? we can't have anything to do. You can't do that. You can't do that. And to the credit of the organizers of this conference, they said, we're doing it. And we're bringing Bishop Strickland. And we're bringing Frank Pavone. And we're doing it. We had like 1,300 people. Wow. Fill, filling, filling, filling the, filling the, it was a tremendous success. And, um, there you, there you have, it. I think that's, that's how I'm doing. And I think that's what, what the people of God need to do. Just keep supporting. If you see us doing the work, then stick with us. As soon as you see us stop doing the work, then stop supporting us. Yeah. Father Pavone, I saw a picture it's you and Pope Francis. You're really smiling and he's looking kind of stern. Is this picture real? What's going on in this picture? Oh, yeah. No, no, there's a picture where he's very expressive. That, that was the <laughs> second time I met him. I, 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 met him a, a, I met him about five times. Uh, that was the second conversation we had. And what he was saying at that moment, I had just reminded him that as head of Priest for Life, I'm also pastoral director of Rachel's Vineyard. Now, I knew that he was aware of Rachel's Vineyard from Argentina and that he had encouraged it. And that he loves to talk about, you know, extending mercy to those that have been wounded or commit the sin of abortion. So I said, Your Holiness, I says, I'm serving as the pastoral director worldwide for Rachel's Vineyard. And, and I was going to say more, but he stopped me and he said, and he was saying at that moment, the picture was snapped. Rachel's Vineyard. Oh, he says, 
that is a wonderful work. It's so good. Move forward with that. And so he wasn't, it wasn't me stern with me, but that expression was like, oh yeah. He was like that kind of a, <laughs> that kind of response. The picture, well, we got Cardinal Schaumborn in the background. He's turned out yeah. to be a real yeah. rascal. Uh, he's talking about rewriting the catechism, even though he was originally involved in the original catechism. But the picture here, I mean, he looks pretty mad at you here, Father Frank. No, Obama. no, no, not at all. I think he's going to yeah. try to slap you in this picture. You're kind of embracing for impact. This whole thing could be reinterpreted in a bad way. But you're saying he's excited about uh, your your care for women who have suffered from abortion. That's what's going on here. Exactly. 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 In I, fact, when I saw this, I heard. saw this. I was like, man, this is AI. This is like Francis slapping Father Frank Pavone. <laughs> No, 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 that picture with Cardinal, with Cardinal Sunborn in it. No, that's that's a completely legitimate photo. And that was, in fact, all of my encounters with him were extremely positive. All of them were him encouraging me in my work. And that's why, you know, Bishop Strickland brought this up, too. There are advisors around him that are really bad news. And it's not to right. take responsibility completely away from him. But we have to realize it's a it's a it's a bigger picture than just what he thinks. But there's a lot of a uh, lot of bad 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 people involved, you know. And I was mentioning about dates. You know the date on which they told Bishop Strickland that he needed to resign voluntarily. That was November 9th, right? That was November 9th. Do you know what day the decree was issued for my laicization last year? November 9th. You're kidding me? Now what's the, you kidding no. me? No. No, no. So November 9th, what's November 9th? Just dedication of St. John Lateran. Uh -huh. The mother and head, the mother and head of all churches. Is In the Rome. Pope using this liturgical day to emphasize to give an accent to saying, "Hey, I'm in charge here." Isn't that interesting? The date That's is exactly the same. Interesting. That can't be an accident. No, two, I don't think the so. The two most prominent American Catholic clerics that get canceled a year apart on the same day? The same day. I don't know, man. I'm looking at this picture again, Father Frank. Maybe he is ticked off at you. I want everybody you in got, the comments you, to do it. You a, want to show it? I, I want everybody in the comments to do a, a, what do you call that, a caption contest. I, I, I like uh, Cardinal Schoenborn in the background. He's like, he knows like what's going on. He's like, oh boy, this is it. This is the showdown at the OK Corral right here. It's going to happen. When, when was this picture snapped, Father? Oh, let me think. What year was this? Now he was elected in 2013. That's the that's when I first met him. This is probably 2014. Okay. Oh, that's a long time ago. Because when yeah. I gave when I gave Pope Francis my book Infiltration, he looks really happy. Uh huh. He looks happy <laughs> here. He doesn't look happy, but it's an amazing photo that I uh, when I saw it, I was like, okay, I am. When I see Father Frank Pavone next, I'm going to ask him about this photo <laughs> because it is like epic level with with show more in the back yeah well you know you know you know somebody was was videotaping that we even have his his voice when he was saying oh, okay. that uh, at that moment yeah they would say oh rachel's vain. he was talking in italian of course he said sure. oh that is a wonderful work wonderful work good and did he i mean when he put down your laicization i mean did he know that he was dealing with the same guy that he that's loves, a good question. He loves your ministry, and yet he's going to sack you. I mean, does he know this? That's, this? that's a very good. That's that's a very good question. I think so, simply because, um, and and I think I shared this with you publicly. Uh, Cardinal um, Parolin spoke to him about the whole situation and said, you know, this is Father Frank Pavone. You know, there are other bishops who would like to take him into their diocese. You know, who one of those was. Joseph Strauss, certain uh -huh. Joseph Strauss. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, we could solve this by, you know, the whole thing was like, well, not the whole thing, because we talked about what the whole thing is all about. But of course, uh, the bishop there that I was under in, in Amarillo, Texas, uh, was really uh, a, a continuous problem and uh, no relationship with him whatsoever. Uh, you can't even call it a relationship that he and I had. So, so on one level, it was like, hey, we could solve this problem just by putting Father Frank under a favorable bishop. Except that goes to prove the point, Taylor, that we were making before. That wasn't really the issue anyway. Because if they had put me under another bishop, if they're concerned about the influence of our ministry and our message and the prominence, well, then their problem would have only gotten worse. 
if they put me under a favorable bishop. That's why it never got resolved. It wasn't my fault. They didn't want the outcome. That would have been a power team if you were in Tyler. Under Strickland. And, and I'm just going to, I'm going to be a little more open than I normally am, but we have a little problem in Texas with bishops. Yes. I'm not saying everybody's evil or bad, but there is a culture, uh, uh, a culture of bishops here. Um, we need help. SOS. Yeah. We need some help yeah. down here. There's just a, I, and I don't even, I'm not even going to say it's like, wicked heretical schismatic i'm just saying that there's a in texas so it's more than one diocese yeah. in texas yeah. there is a spirit of woundedness amongst the lay people yes 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 and uh you know i've i've been here for decades well but it was father john Carapi. uh, uh, uh it was a texas bishop that uh uh instituted the thing with him yeah and and with you and, you know, there was definitely movement against Strickland here in Texas. So, you know, we need to get some exorcists out to Texas and uh, drive some of these demons out because there's there is just this culture of on the on the lay people side, woundedness and maybe on the clerical side or on the on the Episcopal bishop side, authoritarianism. Yeah. Yeah. Too many. It's bad. Yeah. The, the, the bishops maybe have. They're wearing cowboy boots, but they also have spurs on them. Maybe take the spurs off the cowboy boots. Let everybody mm -hmm. let everybody get over the the wounds. Um, also, you know, also you know, Dallas had a major, one of the biggest uh, sexual abuse cases and settlements in the history of the yeah. American Catholic Church. So there's a lot of woundedness yeah. here. And my advice to bishops again, I'm just a layman, but I am a father, so I have some experiences. Be a little more paternal a little more yes. fatherly towards your priests and your lay people. And that's in Texas and that's everywhere. But I think in Texas in particular, we need a little yeah. bit, little less CEO and a little more father, 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 yeah. yeah. Father and brother, like father the church documents brother. say. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So tell us about priest for life. Tell us about your apostolate. What's going on. You, you had this set back a year ago. Hopefully it's been a set up. What's going on? Yeah, we're uh, working hard on, uh, you know, we worked hard in Ohio, of course, these ballot initiatives that the other side is doing. Uh, we're fighting hard on those. Uh, Man, we're helping really rough to watch in Ohio. That, it was mm. sad. That was sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we can, you know, we can have a whole conversation about that. But I, I just want to encourage people things are not as bad as they look there on that front, because the ballot initiatives, uh, that's one front. But you look at all the I mean, we have 14 abortion free states. We got another dozen or so that are restricting uh, and, uh, abortion, protecting the unborn. Uh, the judicial, we're having more and more court victories. Uh, Indiana, for example, is one of the states that protects all the babies. And their state Supreme Court upheld that law. You know, the other side is always trying to strike these laws down. But now Dobbs is precedent. So more of these courts are going to say, yeah, the law can stand. And sh long story short, we're involved in all of those battles. Uh, we're doing voter training. Uh, our our vote website is prolifevote.com. So a uh, prolife vote, we do trainings. We get people on Zoom calls every month. We love our our listeners now to to, to join us, and they can sign up at prolifevote.com. Um, we're doing all that kind of stuff. The things for the clergy are just sent out thousands of copies of my book, proclaiming the message of life. And I think you know, you know, it takes the Sunday readings for every single Sunday of the three year cycle, and it says, okay. Oh, Okay, where do we find the pro-life message in these readings? And uh, it's a great book for preachers. It's a great book for the people in the pews who want to delve into those readings from a pro-life perspective. So proclaimingthemessageoflife.com is the website where they can get that book. Uh, as I say, we're sending out uh, multitudes of those, and we've got a lot more. Um, so those are some of the things we're doing, and we're staying faithful to our mission, bringing the healing to those that have had abortions. And, you know, Janet Morana, our executive director, she's going strong with Silent No More, and the testimonies are getting out there. We just love this work, and we never get tired of doing it. Um, and we're also standing with Bishop Strickland. I think I told you before we have a standwithbishopstrickland.org. We're going to—oh, we need to mention this. I don't know how many of our viewers go to the March for Life. I imagine a lot of them do. We're going to honor Bishop Strickland at the prayer service on the day of the March for Life. Wow. It's January 19th. We have a prayer service that morning in Constitution Hall, National Prayer Service 
Com. If everyone could check that out, if you're coming to Washington, or you could bring your whole bus. We've got a big constitutional hall. It's big. And we want to fill that place and show Bishop Strickland the honor that we want to give him. And we're standing in solidarity. You know who else is going to be there at the prayer service? We're going to honor Sister Dee Dee, Sister oh. Dee Dee Byrne. Love and you Sister know who Dee else Dee. is going to be there? Is um, Mark Houck, the oh. fellow from Philadelphia who's the home the FBI raided. This is going to be an anti-cancel culture prayer service. It's going to be so great. Uh, in fact, I don't know if you're, you're going to be in D.C. at that day. We welcome might, you. I might too. have to, man. Yeah. These, are, these are all my friends you're talking about. Yeah, and Mark Lee Dixon. Talk about Texas. There's something good good that comes out of Texas also. Besides Bishop Strickland is Mark Lee Dixon with the Sanctuary Cities for the Unborn. So those four people, we are going to give them the National Pro-Life Recognition Award. They're all going to be there in person, and they've all agreed to stay and greet the people Take photos. You're going to be able to thank these people face to face. So it's January 19th. It's the day of the March for Life, 830 in the morning, interdenominational service. We'll have a mass before that at 730. And then we're going to uh, then we'll march for life. Uh, so it's going to be great. Nationalprayerservice.com is the website. Awesome. We'll add that to the notes. And then what would you say right now if I could dial up Pope Francis? For Golia. Yes. You know, he has watched yeah. this podcast. I want people to know Francis has watched this. Oh, podcast. I'm sure. So I don't know. Maybe he's going to watch right. it today. All right. But if he's watching or if we could dial him up, what would you say to Pope Francis? Please accompany us. You know, he believes in accompaniment. Uh, I, 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 he, 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 at least he says it all the time. Please accompany us. We are in pain. We need a shepherd. We need a father. And uh, please see our pain. Please understand our pain. Um, and if, and we're not trying to judge, but if for some reason you don't care about that pain, please, please, please stop. Stop. And uh, let somebody else take the, take the chair of Peter. Mm -hmm. What about your appeal for the priesthood? Only Francis or a future pope can reinstate you. Is that correct? Yes. So what would you say with regard to that? To this Pope or a future what I Pope? Would say, what I would say is just look at my, I just had on November 12th, by the way, my 35th uh, anniversary of ordination. Congratulations. And I celebrate. Thank you. Thank you. I celebrated it because, and I would just say to them humbly, I said, look at my, look at my record of service. Talk to those, those whom I serve, starting in the parish. Uh, that I served in New York City under Cardinal O'Connor. Talk, talk to the people. I can't. Nobody is a judge in his own case. Talk to the people I've served. Talk to the people I've served over my years as heading up Priests for Life, thirty years now. Talk to the women. Uh, talk to Abby Johnson, um, who 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 I helped to bring to healing. Uh, she's so well known now uh, for her journey out of the abortion industry. I was privileged to minister or to her on that journey. And so, and I think that that's the record has to speak for itself. And I, 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 and I just humbly want to continue being able, I mean, I'm continuing to advocate for these people, but to be able to continue to minister the sacraments to them as well. Um, that's what I want to do. That's what I've always wanted to do. And I would say to them, you know, my intention of serving the church as a priest and in the pro-life realm has never wavered. These all these all these all these years, it's never changed. What the church has asked of me, and required of me, and the hoops they want me to go through, that's been all over the map. But what I've asked for humbly and faithfully hasn't changed at all. Beautiful. That, that's what I would say. Beautiful. Well, I love it. I love it. Well, Father, can you give us a blessing, or is that out? Well, you know, lay people can give blessing. You know, you look at the book of mm -hmm. blessings. And it says, if one is not a priest or a deacon, they say this prayer. And the difference but you is, are a priest. That, you are a priest. Well, wow. I am. Well, I am. I am. But I, I you know, I respect the limitations that that okay. they're putting on the exercise of the ministry. However, uh, we can all bless each other in the sense of asking the Lord for the blessing. So let's do that. Let's let's do let's that. Do that. Yes. Lord, Lord, I want to thank you first of all for my brother uh, Taylor and the work that he does and the faithfulness he he exhibits and the love uh, that he has for your people and for you in, in serving the truth every day through these broadcasts. Lord, we want to pray for Bishop Strickland. We want to pray for uh, all who have been uh, canceled, whether priests or laity, people who have been persecuted by the civil government or by the church 
church government. And Lord, above all, and finally, we pray for all those that are watching and listening right now, all the needs they have, all the intentions they present to you, whether publicly or in the privacy of their hearts. Send us, Lord God, your blessing, your peace, the joy and peace that come only from you and that no one can take away from us. We ask this blessing in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Oh, Amen. Can we say, oh. can we say Hail Mary Holy together Spirit. too? Absolutely. All right. Together. Hail Mary, full of grace. Full of grace. The, Lord the Lord is with is thee. Be. Blessed art blessed thou are amongst th women, women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, of Jesus. Holy Mary, Holy Mother of God, Mother, pray for us, pray for us now and at the now, hour of our death. Yeah. Amen. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for pray us. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Father Amen. Frank, Bone, you, you mentioned uh, the Stand With Bishop Strickland website. Can you share that again? Yes, standwithbishopstrickland.org. People can leave a spiritual bouquet there. Okay. And then Priest for Life and your, your other apostolate in your ministry, connect people there too. Yes, the main website is endabortion.us, endabortion.us, and you'll see all the different aspects of our ministry there. Beautiful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for watching. Everyone, thank you for being here, supporting Father Frank Pavone, and uh, make sure you like this video. I would encourage y'all right now, uh, there was a big audience today. I think there's 2,600 people watching, but share this video. Uh, I, I feel that this video was a kind, sober, reflective approach to something that a lot of people are hurting over. So I think this video would be helpful and would minister to a lot of people's spirit. So I would encourage this, this video in particular, I would share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter, um, share links um, for the uh, ministries and apostolates that, that Father Pavone just spoke about. And... Um, yeah, subscribe if you haven't subscribed. And where can people um, engage with you every day, Father? What's the best way? Yes, on social media, at FR Frank Pavone, on all the major platforms, at FR Frank Pavone, social media. Perfect. All right, everyone. Remember, our Lord Jesus Christ is the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless. Godspeed. Thank you, Father Pavone. See you next time. Thank you.